So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have been working at trying to develop a program that helps us um, build <clears throat> more information, more capacity for our students to uh, enroll, if not learn about resources that are available for graduate school. We devoted this week to law school. So we'll have um, three presentations from three amazing women who work in this field um, and write levels um, I had an opportunity to um, partner with them over the years. Um, Rodina and I are just new, but we still have worked together indirectly through work that I've done in the past. Um, and then we will have on Wednesday, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Rinza Tanita Pipestem. She's the, um, oh, I'm forgetting specifically her, her I think she's the, um, she's a judge for the Eastern Band Cherokee. Um, but then we'll also have um, Sarah Davidson and um, Jaylene Kukish, Kukish. Kukish yeah, uh, with us. And they'll be talking about careers in law on Wednesday. And then we'll have a variety of schools on um, Thursday who to present, um, thanks to the help of both Rodina, Kate, and Kristen. So um, they'll have um, Harvard um, University of California, Berkeley, Arizona State University, University of New Mexico, University of Arizona, and University of Michigan, or Michigan State. I'm forgetting which one it is. Michigan State. Michigan State. Um, we'll all be presenting on Thursday about their schools. So without further ado, uh, I'll take a moment just to um, help us all sort of ground ourselves and to remember where we are, the land that we're from, and the people that we bring with us. Um, acknowledge your elders, your ancestors, and help them to, I invite them into the space with us to help us do our learning and hear what we're supposed to hear. So again, thank you all for showing up today. And I will start off with, um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves or if you guys wanna go ahead and introduce as you present, well, I guess we're gonna start with Kristen and go from there. Yeah, I can introduce myself and I'll leave it up to Rodina and Kate, whether they wanna hop in and, or do it at the part, start of their presentations. Um, uh, so um, I'm Kristen Thies Alvarez. I'm the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. I use the pronouns she, her, and they. Um, and um, I am a uh, citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, but I also identify as Chicana. I grew up in Oakland, California, um, and I still live, uh, well, actually next door to my mother, <laughs> about 10 minutes away to, from my grandmother. Um, so this is, this feels very much like home. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And um, I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, actually, you know what, Rodina and Kate, do you guys <coughs> mind introducing yourselves now? It feels sort of strange to to not do that. I'll go ahead. My name is Kate Rozier. I am a member of the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma. Um, I've been working at ASU Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law since 2000. I'm excited to be here. My role at ASU is to do recruitment, retention, and help students just enjoy law school a little bit more at ASU. And so I'm excited to be here because we do a lot of work in pre-law and we want to make sure all of you are as informed as possible going forward. So I'm proud to be working with Kristen and Rodina on this. Hello, everyone. I'm Rodina Cave Parnell. I use the pronouns she and her. I am in um, Albuquerque. Uh, New Mexico right now with the American Indian Law Center. I'm Quechua uh, and I, um, I'm the director of the Pre-Law Summer Institute and I will tell you all about uh, PLSI um, when it's my turn to present. Uh, it is a program that uh, we hope that you'll attend before you go to law school, so the summer before you go to law school. But my, uh, my colleagues here are, are, will also explain the other things that are available before that. <laughs> so I'll talk to you in a few minutes. Thanks so much. So um, I, I think in some ways, um, I'm, I'm a little bit of the uh, setter of the, the trail and then these guys are gonna take us most of the way um, home, although I'm available to answer questions throughout. And I hope as Jack suggested that you will really post questions. This time is for you. Um, uh, again, I'm Kristen. I'm the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at Berkeley. I've been at Berkeley since 2007 and there I do oversee all of the JD admissions functions. Um, and that includes programs programs like pre-law outreach, but also reading files, making decisions, making scholarship and grant award 
towards helping people come and um, supporting them even in, after graduation through loan repayment assistance. Uh, so I get to see kind of the really, really wide spectrum of people interested in law school and talk to lots of people, although now mostly over the computer screen, um, but uh, often before in person. So I'm going to briefly kind of give you a, a little bit of the lay of the land of um, why we hope you'll consider law school um, and sort of what the, the need is. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen uh, just to make this a little bit, well, to help me uh, stay on, uh, on task here. Um, so I, I always also want to start with an acknowledgement that even though we are all far apart, um, the university that I serve uh, sits on indigenous land, um, unceded indigenous land, and is a direct beneficiary as a land grant institution of the displacement of the native peoples whose homelands this is. Um, the Chokcheno speaking Ohlone people, uh, descendants of the historic and once federally recognized sovereign band of Alameda County, Rona Band. Um, and, uh, and I work really hard in a bunch of capacities to make sure that I can hold the university accountable um, in, in making this more than lip service um, in terms of a land acknowledgement. Uh, so, so briefly, I just wanted to, to, again, tell you guys, you know, I'm going to talk about what the issue is, and my dog's going to bark in the background, um, <laughs> and then uh, Kate's going to talk in detail about the application process, and Rodina is going to talk about critical programs like PLSI and what they can mean for you. <clears throat> So in terms of Native nations and communities, um, this is a slide that I included, but often this is a presentation that I'm doing to non-Native peoples. So part of the purpose of this slide is to remind my colleagues in admissions in law school, in teaching and in the profession, uh, that, that Native peoples exist, persist, are diverse, dynamic communities, um, and, and are in every single state. Um, I updated this, so it went from something like 567 federally recognized tribes to 570 for. There are numerous other state recognized tribes and many, many, many communities um, that are not recognized formally, but still exist. Uh, that's particularly important in the state that I work in, which is California, um, because of the, the way that the federal government policies and the state actions uh, served to displace and, um, and uh, really uh, impact negatively Native communities. Uh, so there is a large Native population, um, and importantly, as you guys know, as Jack knows, we're students, right? Um, we're, we're in the K through 12 pipeline. We're thinking about what's right for us in terms of colleges. We're thinking about what our career goals are. We're thinking about how to take care of our families and how to take care of our elders and how to take care of future generations, but also how to take care of our communities in general. Um, these days we might just be thinking about also what's next for us, how we can develop further to reach our goals. At the same time, uh, we face significant barriers and those barriers are uh, sort of multifaceted and I won't talk a great deal about them, but um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with structural and systemic racism. Um, if you go to, for example, the law school websites or the Law School Admissions Council website or others, you'll sometimes find statistics that um, where we've simply been erased, right? Where we exist or don't exist because we're in numbers too small to articulate. This recently came up and you may have heard the term um, paper genocide before, but this recently came up because the National Association of Law Placement, which is the organization that looks at career outcomes for lawyers and tracks those, did a really extensive um, report on the, the state of women lawyers and uh, including women lawyers of different ethnicities and they simply entirely omitted native women um, which is ironic because we're sitting here with three native women <laughs> doing this presentation and you have a panel of three native women but in fact there were so few native women um, that the people who were doing the survey made the decision simply not to include us in that calculation. So you can't even find the, the data. Um, and it is a pretty small percentage of American Indian and Alaska Native students who have received a graduate professional degree, uh, about 5% compared to 10% of the total population. 
So this is a slightly old set of data from 2018, but part of the reason I chose not to update it is because little has changed, which is why we're here today and trying to do the work that we do. Um, the numbers of applicants to law schools, to ABA accredited law school um, has remained rather flat. Uh, it is not large, particularly when compared to Caucasian white, but also when compared to Hispanic Latino, uh, to Asian, to Black African American. Um, and so we're not seeing, probably as a result of a number of factors uh, that begin much earlier than law school in the pipeline, which is often how we refer to this. Um, I think we started using that word well before pipeline became so fraught, frankly. Um, and uh, uh, you know, our, our charge then is to figure out how do we move this? How do we not see year after year uh, between 12 and 1300 native people applying to law school? Um, so this is in fact a three year trend going back to 2016. And you can see that those numbers are in fact almost identical year after year. Um, it, it, sometimes the percent changes look dramatic but it's because the numbers are small. And so small changes make a big difference. Going back one step, and Kate's really going to talk about the application process, but one of the real and perceived barriers to law school is the LSAT. Um, and sometimes that's just the reputation of test gets, sometimes that's the real cost of taking the test um, and a variety of other factors or access or lack of access to preparatory programs, et cetera. Uh, but you can see that the problem starts far earlier than the application moment, far earlier than the admissions moment and far earlier than the bar taking moment. Um, and if you look at the application or the test taking numbers, those two, while they vary from year to year, uh, don't move dramatically. I, I would like maybe us to take a little bit of credit uh, for in the pipeline to law program, because there has been some improvement in the test taker numbers. And maybe Kate, you can talk about the number of people who through our program, we have actually provided LSAT prep courses to. Uh, I think that that does make a difference. And we are starting to see some of those improvements. And this is the number of admitted students. Um, and so uh, you can see that not everybody who applies to law school gets admitted, but a lot of people, about three quarters or so of them do. Um, and uh, that is, again, a number just that hasn't particularly changed over time. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight as well is that You'll see sometimes in different places, numbers cited slightly differently. I think there was a difference between the LSAC, which is Law School Admissions Council data, and the ABA, which is American Bar Association data. Um, one thing that's true is that the definitions that organizations use to define who is Native American, American Indian, Alaska Native, or other can vary. And one of the reasons we need more policymakers who are Indigenous and we need more lawyers who are Indigenous is so that we have more sort of influence and control even in how we are talked about and data is collected around our identity. Um, because that in and of itself, if we don't have the information, we can't actually make changes. We have no idea if this is an overinflated number, right? Or if this is a real underestimated number because there's people with multiple ethnicities or um, you know people who identify as indigenous but primarily from Mexico or something like we, we just don't know. Um, so it is an area where there's definitely improvement that could be made. Um, and in terms of the, the US population and the pipeline into legal careers, um, you can see kind of where that stands. This is a um, this is really the slide that I'm going to end on, although I have some resource slides, but maybe uh, we can share those with you afterwards. Um, I think the thing to point out here is if you go back to what I talked about in the very beginning, the number of federally and state recognized tribes, the number of tribal communities, the number of tribal courts, about 426 court systems in operation, the number of federal courts, the number of state courts, and then you compare that with the number of um, Alaskan Native and American Indian lawyers that are being produced, there's a huge, huge gap. There's an unmet need. Um, somebody is our lawyer somebody is our judge hearing our case, somebody is our state representative, uh, somebody is making policy about us. And if we are not the people who have earned the law degrees and sort of have the tools and are 
in the room to help influence decisions. Um, you know, somebody's making deals for us. Someone's negotiating contracts um, to, for access to land and resources. Uh, and, and we need more native attorneys. If that is what you feel called to do to advocate for your community in this way, and there are many ways to advocate for a community. But if you do feel called to this particular type of work, um, I would just like you to know that there is a whole network of us who are here to be your cheerleaders, who are here to you know, be your nagging aunties, um, who are here to be your advocates and your allies and to provide you information because we see this tremendous need and we know that the only way to meet it is for you to decide that you can do this, you're wanted, you're needed, and for us to prepare you um, with the tools that you will need to be successful. So I will stop there and turn it over to uh, Kate and let me stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Kristen. I'll um, chat for a little bit before I share my couple slides. So I met um, Kristen and our partner at a program called Graduate Horizons. It's another one of these type of programs to assist students going into um, any kind of graduate program. We were all on the law panel together. And what we realized at that time is that so many students were applying incorrectly that we needed to do the program more regularly. So I really consider us a sister program to the Graduate Horizons program. And um, our, our little program, so we're, we're listed as Pathways to Law and Pipeline to Law, but we're the same thing. We're still trying to figure out, do we change our name to Pathways or can we stick with Pipeline? Because we got a lot of flack for being the Pipeline program. But um, so we're the same group. Um, but we started this several years ago and, um, we based our program off of um, a national Native American Bar Association study where they really did a deep dive into what was going on, why weren't there more lawyers in the profession. And during that pro and through that study, they realized a couple things is that Native students weren't getting pre-law advising and if they were getting it, it was poor. Um, they weren't doing LSAT prep or doing the things that non-Native law students were doing before they applied, and that um, most of them were applying at the deadline or after the deadline way late. So, so we built a program around these things to try to reach more students. Another interesting fact is that they we realized that we needed to hit college age students or get them involved in this process or at least get them thinking about law school in their second semester sophomore year, if not earlier. And so I don't know what years all of you are, but I have a hunch that some of you are already done with college or about done with college. And the reason why they want us to reach students earlier are because those students can still change their GPA and they can still take classes that are going to help them be better students. So we were, we were trying to figure out a way to reach those students plus students like many of you on this call who may already have their GPA set. So through a grant, we were able to find money to bring students together for a week and um, also provide LSAT prep for those students who um, wanted to really prepare for the LSAT. And we wanted to make sure that everybody had the opportunity to do that. So with grant funds, um, we put together the Native American Pipeline slash Pathway to Law. And let me pull up my slides now. I was gonna show some of these, right? Um, I'm sorry, you're probably seeing the wrong screen, but I'll just go with this because I always mess it up. But this is kind of our little logo. Um, so we've been funded by tribes, we've been funded by grants to make this happen. And again, we've had students from ages 20 or 19 who are currently sophomores to 
students who are in their 60s. And so for the, there was a question in the chat about non-traditional students. We have more non-traditional students usually than the ones who are currently in the, the early part of their college careers. So, so what makes us unique in this program is that we are three law schools, Berkeley, ASU, Michigan State, and the Rodina's pre-law program through the American Indian Graduate Center. And we work with an LSAT test company. And we all come together just to give you as much information that we can before you start applying to law schools. So we want to get you early. We wanna make sure you're as prepared as possible. And the best way to do that is through these workshops. So we've currently, um, this summer will be our seventh year in our eighth program. And um, we just think it's really important to keep doing these. So in our program, we do several things. So one, you have direct contact with all of us. And, um, you know, again, Kristen said she's the Dean of Berkeley's Law School and she's donating her time to make sure that you have as much information as possible. Um, I read files, the Michigan State person reads files and we're trying to incorporate other schools and we hope to do that soon because everybody wants access to native students. The other thing that um, we do that's kind of unique is in many of these programs, we're trying to get you to come to our law school. In our Pipeline to Law Initiative, we do not recruit you. It's not that we don't want you to come to our law school, but we think it's more important to work with you and help you think about what you need from a law school. So we don't put any recruitment pressure on you. We do not try to sell our schools but we give you all the tools to help you figure out what the best school for you is and how you will be more, most successful. So for some people, that means um, you want to go to the school where you're gonna leave without a lot of debt. For some of you, that might be a school closer to home. For some of you, you might wanna go to the highest ranked law school that you get into. And so whatever, works for you, we want to give you those ideas and suggestions and help you put together an application for that. We will also put you through a mock class with an Indian law professor so you can see what a law school class is like. We actually consider it a success if you go through our program and realize law school might not be for you. Because if you go through and say, wow, I really don't like this stuff, then that might have saved you a couple hundred thousand dollars in law school tuition. Um, so we want to make sure, again, you're informed. So in our program, we just walk you through everything application. So, you know, what should you look for in the different school applications? Um, what is a personal statement? We'll have people who will read your statements. You'll do a draft statement. We'll review them and give you feedback. Um, we walk you through what schools, um, how to pick your schools, how many schools you should apply to, what ranges of schools should you be applying to. Um, we'll do a session on financial aid so that you know how much it costs, what's the difference between the tuition expense and cost of attendance. And we also do mock file reviews, work with you on letters of recommendation. But I think most importantly is we also put you on a timeline so that you're applying um, when all the non-native students are applying. Did you know that most students of color apply at the deadline or after the deadline? We start admitting students in August, September, and um, most of our students will apply at the very end where there's less seats and less money available. And so we don't want that to happen to you. Um, so here's the part that makes us really, really different is that through this grant money and um, donations that we've received, we actually have funds available to help you pay for an LSAT prep course. In order to get our prep course, you have to jump through a couple hoops from us because we were burned a couple times where 
students took our money and then didn't take the LSAT or didn't complete their prep course. And so we make sure that you're registered for the LSAT. We make you do research on all the different courses to let us know what one's best for you. You have to agree to share your information and you also have to do your timeline to show us when you're gonna to apply to law school and that you've put some um, thought into what you're doing before we give you the free um, test prep. The other thing we try to share are also the free um, resources available. So for example, the Law School Admissions Council has um, partnered with the Khan Academy. So you can go through a test prep with them at absolutely no expense. Um, you can use that as a supplement before you do your uh, pay for um, LSAT prep. So there's lots of different things that you can do to make sure that you're as prepared as possible. Um, here's a couple stats from our um, summers. So I mentioned it's the seventh year, eighth program. We've had close to 200 students go through and if you look at this, we need our need it, we need uh, to reach our native men. 55 men and 136 women have gone through. Um, 126 LSAT prep courses ranged about $100,000 we've paid for those. And we've seen people increase 16 points. Um, there's been um, a couple at 15. And um, it really depends on how much time and work they are really putting into improving those scores. But, but we feel that this program has made a difference for students and really helped them get into their dream schools. So for this summer, it is a virtual program. It's gonna be June 8th through July 15th. It is, um, we did it virtually last year. So we um, get on Zoom for an hour and a half three days a week and basically walk you through a bunch of different subject areas. Um, I will put this uh, link or maybe somebody can put the link in the chat, um, but it's, we ask you to write a little personal statement that we'll use to help um, draft your personal statement for law school. And um, we'll get started in June. Is there anything I left off, Kristen, that you think we should um, um, talk to them about? Okay. So if you have any questions about that, we'll visit it in the chat or you can ask after. But we also consider this program the companion program to Rodina's program, the Pre-Law Summer Institute. So when we were talking about setting this up, what we realized is PLSI has been around for a long time, but many of the students who were going through PLSI needed help before they started applying to law school. So we're in this as a team and Rodina can now talk to you about um, her program and how it all comes together and um, kind of rounds out your legal career. Hello everyone, I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, uh, yeah, before, so when, I, like I said earlier, PLSI happens the summer before you go to law school. So the idea is that you attend PLSI, you apply for PLSI sort of in the spring um, of that year and then you go through the program and then you attend law school just really just a few weeks after you get out of PLSI. So that missing piece for a lot of our students that Kristen and Kate picked up that is really key to um, getting into law school and having all of the options um, that you want. You want more options. You want to, you don't want something like a late application to sort of, you know, uh, to narrow your, your options. And so um, I you know, applaud what they're doing. And, for, and so when they say that you know, they're, they're neutral and that you know, there's no recruitment except for PLSI, <laughs> because we do sort of recruit heavily for PLSI in the pipeline program. Um, and, and the pipeline program, as, you know, as Kate was saying that, um, and I saw some questions about this, like uh, you would wanna take Ideally, you would want to go through the pipeline program 
the year before um, you're applying to PLSI and applying to law school. So for instance, our program, so the pipeline program this year happens in June and July. Well, our program happens in June and July, but their program is really, a, is the pipeline program is about, um, you know, how do you apply? How do you successfully apply? Is this what you really want to do? And our program is about, you want to do this. You've already applied to law school. You, you intend on an, uh, attending in the fall and um, you just want to get the skills together to, um, to be successful while you're in law school. So um, what are our goals? You know, I usually have a couple slides before this, but I'm, you know, I'm really glad that uh, Kristen and, and, and Kate sort of filled in some of this stuff because we talk about like, so what is the need for Native attorneys? What's the demand here? What are we looking at? Why are we doing this? Um, and, you know, our program has been around for a long time. And our, our, the goals of the program have always been the same. This is where you learn how to be a successful law student. This is where you learn the skills to do well in law school. Um, and, and it's not, and you know, there, there can't be those sorts of like huge changes um, in that summer, right? So if you needed help on writing, and that's why the pipeline program is so important. If you, if you want to take more writing classes while, or if someone says, hey, I think you should take more writing classes where you're getting feedback on your writing, the time to get that feedback is, is before you, you ever graduate. So you have the opportunity to take those other classes. And so that's why the pipeline program is great. Um, but our program is really about what are the skills that you need to be successful in law school, you know, developing that cohort. Uh, because our students go to school everywhere. We're housed at the uh, University of New Mexico School of Law, but our students go to school everywhere, all over the United States. And for some students, when they go to law school, they might be the only Native student in that law school. And so having a cohort um, is going to be really important. And we also work on some professional development. So what's involved? Typically, when it's an in-person program, we have three substantive law classes. There's always an Indian law class. And the reason this started is because there weren't Indian law classes in law schools. And, but there was always an Indian law class at, at PLSI. And uh, we just continue with that because some students might be going to law school where there isn't an Indian law class. And then we have you know, two other first-year classes, contracts, torts, properties, something else. And there's always a legal writing class. Um, and in the legal writing class, there's a legal memo, an appellate brief, and then oral arguments. And some people live for the oral arguments. That's all they want to do. <laughs> they just want the opportunity to get before the podium and make their argument. But there's a lot of stuff that goes before that, because that's at the end of the program. Uh, who's our faculty? They're law school professors. They're actual law school professors from ABA accredited law schools. It really varies. Many of them are native. They're usually from schools with native student population or an Indian law program. They're the ones who will write your evaluations. Um, and then we, we have teaching assistants. I talked a little bit about what the in-person program looks like. We have last year, we did an online program and this year we also do, we're doing an online program. And so it's fewer classes. Um, so one, um, instead of three substantive classes, you'll be taking two substantive classes and the legal writing class. Um, and you know we try to have more one-on-one -on -one time and focus on the skills. So what are the skills that you need to be successful in law school? Well, first you need to learn how to read a case. Like it's not like regular reading. <laughs> it is different. It really is different. Um, so you're, when you're reading, you're, you're looking for the rule. You're trying to identify issues. Um, we, you know, we, we focus on that, the, you know, legal analysis, briefing and outlining. Uh, time management is really important in PLSI and in law school. And then test taking skills, not just essay, test taking skills, but how do you take a multiple choice exam? Jack, am I missing things in the chat that I need to answer? Um, no, I'll bring them up unless you're ready. Okay. I mean, if you're ready to, for questions, I can go down the list I've been writing up, so. Well, I just don't wanna to get too far behind. Some of it might be oh. answered in my, my PowerPoint, so let's, yeah, let's see. Yeah, um, just, I'm gonna wait and then we'll go through. But okay. thank you for inquiring, thank you. Law school connections are really important in PLSI too. Um, now, some students will come to PLSI. They've already been accepted to a law school. They know exactly where they're going. They already have their apartment in their new town. 
Um, they've got their financial aid package and everything, and they don't want to talk to any other schools. That's fine. That's great. <laughs> but there are some students, maybe they got into law school, but it wasn't the one that they wanted to get into. And some students, maybe they didn't, they applied to law school, but they haven't been accepted yet. They're still on the wait list. Um, and so we have connections to law schools and they come to our program to recruit over the summer. We have one-on-one -on -one interviews with the, uh, with the law school admissions staff. So it's not just where they come in and talk to you and try to recruit, recruit you through a big program. It is one-on-one -on -one appointments where you can share information about yourself and ask them um, questions that are really important to you as an individual. And uh, you know, it's great that you know, so we see Kate and Kristen every year because they're huge supporters of our program um, and they're interested in talking to our students. Uh, so, and we also work with some law schools on conditional admissions. So um, what's a conditional admit? It's when a law school will accept you on the condition that you attend PLSI and, you know, it, the conditions depend. Sometimes it's graduate in the top half of the class, or sometimes it's get a 2.7 or better, um, but they'll be clear with you on whatever the condition is. And so some students, when they come to PLSI, they don't know yet if they're going to go to law school in the fall, but they'll find out at the end of the program when the when the, their evaluations are into the law schools. And I don't just send the evaluations. The students have to tell me who to send the evaluations to. Uh, they have to direct me. And so, but, you know, in line with that, the professor is the one that provides the evaluation, um, writes the evaluation. So if you have four, you know, if you have four professors over the summer, each one of those professors will write an evaluation. There's one after midterms and then one after finals. Um, and, you know, some, most of the time they recommend students for law school. Sometimes they don't recommend students for law school. Um, and law schools rely on this, and that's why they're willing to do conditional ad, um, admissions with us. And it's not all law schools. It's um, a handful of, of law schools who will do that. We get our funding from uh, Bureau of Indian Education, Law School Admissions Council. We're very grateful, and, um, and also private contributions. So what are your financial consistent, uh, con considerations for attending PLSI? Because this is a full-time program. When you go to PLSI, this is all you're going to do. We don't want you to work or anything. So it's a commitment. Um, you know, no employment. We usually ask tribes to help with funding for living expenses. We didn't do that last year. We don't plan on doing that this year um, because of the pandemic. And so we provide living allowances. So the program, the B, the, the grants, all of our grants will provide the tuition and fees and the books. Um, we have separate funding to, plot, to uh, provide living allowances for students to, to live for the summer in Albuquerque. And we also do that for students now that it's online. We still do that, um, but you'd be living wherever you're living. Uh, and typically if it's you know, in person, you're gonna, you'll find housing. Uh, we have like a, a list of when people reach out to us and they say, I have a sublet available and it's up to you to do the vetting but we usually have some sort of list. Okay, what does an application look like? We have an application form. Um, you have to send your LSAC academic summary report and LSAT scores to us because we're not a law school. We don't have access to that system. So I know that if you're applying to law school, if you've already applied, you're like, hey, I send all that to LSAC. Yeah, but you have to send it to us because we don't have access to that. We're not a law school. We also require your official transcripts, two letters of recommendation, a personal statement, a resume. And these are all the things that the pipeline program helps you to work on and to think about. Um, so that's why they're such a good step before PLSI. Uh, and then proof of membership, we're required to ask. And then proof of, uh, of law school application. We don't require that you have been admitted. We only require that you apply. You just have to show me that you have a complete application at a law school. And then by the end of the summer, you will have completed eight weeks, classes, taken midterms and final exams, written a legal memo, presented court arguments, and through the course of this, learned all of those skills that you need to know in order to be successful in law school. We have, and if, if you go through PLSI, there's some other sort of things that we sort of expanded beyond just the you know, the summer program, but 
you know, there's also a serious lack of tribal judges um, of, uh, sorry, native people on the federal bench, on the state benches, and even in tribal courts. Um, so we're looking past law school graduation for, you know, additional opportunities for our students. We know that there's a relationship between judicial clerkships and securing um, judicial positions later on. And so we've developed a program to encourage more uh, judicial clerks, and that is available um, if you're a PLSI alum. Um, we're partnering with some other organizations now to try to get our students internships, important internships. And, you know, and we know that uh, there's a there's a correlation between clerking and then later on becoming a judge. And so some of our students know already they want to become a judge and some students sort of learn along the way, but we want them to have this opportunity. And we've just been really successful in the past few years for, we looked back over PLSI for like 30 years and we could, we could find maybe six clerks. And just over the past four years, we've had 12 clerks. Um, and, you know, here's the different courts that they've, they've gotten clerkships on. And we have a, a committee. We also um, have funding for, and again, this is just for PLSI folks, to we try to help students who want summer clerkships with tribes or tribal courts. Not every tribe or tribal court can pay. And so we found funding, funding so that we can help the student to, um, to earn money while they're doing their clerkship. Because a lot of students, they want that legal experience in tribal law and Indian law. We also have a bar passage initiative. We can reimburse for bar review courses. I mean, this is like three years down the road, but we're thinking about it, right? Um, we have attorney coaching program. We have additional resources for um, examinees. And this is also available for, for students who don't attend PLSI. So if you, you know, if you end up not attending PLSI and you still want access to this, um, there's you know, applications online right now for for non-PLSI alums. We've got great connections for, I mean, the network that you get in PLSI is amazing. Um, you, you are, you know, you will be connected to so many other um, folks who have been through the program and who are now lawyers. And Deb Holland is one of our uh, alumni. Um, Cherise Davids, also uh, one of the first Native American Congresswomen. We've really, this program over the course of years have, has really impacted the numbers in the face of um, natives, native attorneys. So should I go to PLSI? Um, there's lots of, you know, it's, it's the place where you, you would get the skills to be successful in law school. And the purpose of that is, you know, you don't wanna like end up in law school and have to start learning how to be a successful law student while you're in law school. <laughs> With PLSI, you, you learn it from day, so that day one, you are ready. You have the skills. You've already seen the big picture. You've gone through midterms. You've gone through finals. You've, you've, um, you've written. You understand what it's like to get hardcore feedback on your writing in the legal setting. Um, <laughs> you won't be as sensitive <laughs> when you get into law school. Um, and the challenge is you'll, you'll already have that sort of um, confidence when you're going into law school. So I'm ready for questions if I didn't. Oh, and these are our dates for this year. Great. Um, there are some really good questions. So I will, um, the last one I just saw was one of the, is one of the most, I always think about this and so I'm glad that it was asked. But I'll start off with the questions if you guys are ready to sort of throw out answers. Um, the, the, the first question was, you know, is there, um, are there dual programs? So JD, MA programs, MS programs out there that you know of that, um, that could be highlighted. I don't, I mean, I was thinking of your program, Kate, but I don't, I mean, that's not, I don't our, know if that's, if that's our a most, good work. Yeah, our most common joint degree is um, the JD MBA, Masters of Business Administration. Um, but there are lots of opportunities to kind of, um, we have a JD, PhD. We've had students who have gotten their master's in social work while getting their JD. So um, every school will have specialized programs <laughs> that you can look through. And 
some of that might come out more on Thursday's session when schools are talking about what they have to offer. But uh, joint degrees are very common. I know Kristen has a lot at Berkeley. Yeah, um, I'll, I, you know, I'll put the link up actually to UCLA, which is not Berkeley, <laughs> um, because I know that they have a joint JDMA specifically in American Indian Studies. Um, other institutions may as well. Uh, most JD programs, and I do want to distinguish, there are also programs called LLM programs or MLS programs. So there's a world of possibilities. The JD is typically what leads to you being able to take the bar exam and practice law, although there may be slightly alternate pathways. And there are alternate pathways for sure if your goal is narrowly um, to focus and, and practicing in tribal court. But um, uh, almost every school has a JD MBA, often a JD master's in public policy, perhaps one in social welfare. Um, you know, there, there are things to consider. Fewer have them in Native American studies or American Indian studies, but they do exist. One thing I try to tell people is we get tons of people who are very interested in doing a joint degree program, um, and that's fantastic. You do them typically in four years. So uh, one year in one program, one year in another program, two years of taking uh, classes in both programs and sort of swapping credits back and forth. But that does mean that you're paying tuition for a fourth year because the JD is typically a three-year program. Um, and it does mean that that is an additional year that you aren't working. So you, sometimes people talk about that as opportunity cost, a year when you might not be otherwise sort of progressing in your career. So they're a great fit for the people who are very clear about why they're important to them. Um, but there are, you know, if you want to be a law professor, you don't have to have a master's or a PhD. If you want to be a practicing attorney, you can't do it with a master's in public policy. So there are just some considerations about fit and what's the right thing for your family and life and goals. Yeah, I think that's one of the crucial statements is that, you know, when you're thinking about um, inserting yourself into a program, you know, there was just a question that, you know, Sarah just asked between the JD and the MPP in reference to federal Indian law reform, you know, it, it's hard to sort of pinpoint like if that's a reality when it depends on what kind of law reform you're going to do, because you don't necessarily need a law degree or a JD to do law reform. You can do a policy, you can just go in there right now and start advocating for law reform with your um, bachelor's. So it just depends on like, you try to think of like, how is this really gonna sort of come to fruition in reference to your long-term objective in reference to what it is that you want to be. So if you want to be a lawyer and you want to do litigation, if you want to do some of the hard, you know, um, practical work that comes along with legal um, study research and implementation and, um, and just the, the pieces of law, then a JD probably is gonna be helpful. But if you're looking at just sort of getting into the system to sort of exercise your capacity to be helpful, like, talk to somebody. And I think that this is one of the things that is, is really crucial about these programs and these people and the people who are admissions in JDs, like have a really good conversation about like, this is where I, I think I wanna do some work. And like, what do you recommend? Is a JD really gonna be worth it or not? We need lawyers specifically for some specific reasons in Indian country. But if you can build the capacity to do policy reform and be helpful, without a JD, then even that's gonna be useful to them too. You know, and that's why some of these programs, like even the program that Kate and what we mentioned, the LLL, LLMs and M, M, what was the other one? The MLMs, yeah. those programs allow for the capacity for um, lead into policy understanding and how it sort of like comes to fruition. So that's something to also sort of think about as you move into your um, thinking about law school. One other thing to note is there's a really big difference between federal Indian law and tribal law and policy. And sometimes I think they get conflated, um, right? That we just talk about them as if we're like Indian law is one thing. Um, but, you know, fe federal Indian law is looking particularly at the relationship between the United States federal government and Indian nations going back to the first sort of treaty making moments um, and, and moving forward to where we are now. Um, and it's really exciting and it's a powerful tool, but it, it's it's not the only uh, space, right? Um, our indigenous communities had law um, in, in, and had peacemaking in a particular ways that were unique to us. And many tribal courts are now trying to sort of reestablish those. Many tribal, uh, you know, councils are trying to revisit the, the constitutions that were really just pushed on us as boilerplate um, sort of things and look at them now through our own uh, historical and cultural and linguistic lens. So you you may realize that what you want to do is advocate in a space that doesn't you know require you to to have a JD. Um, but if you 
you know, if you want to be a lawyer, um, or if sometimes if you think if you want to be in DC, uh, where everybody has a lawyer, even if they're not a lot of even if they're not lawyering, um, it, it can be a little bit of a, um, the thing that gets you in the door or the thing that takes you serious, gets you taken seriously. I, I want to jump in and also mention Trista was asking about her, she said she's currently in an MLS program. And is this available to her and, and I think Trista's route is kind of something we're seeing quite a bit of through our program is that we'll have several students who um, do the master's program and realize they really love the law and then want to go to law school. So definitely your, our program is for you and can help you with your application. Um, but I think if you're thinking about doing a master's degree instead of a law degree, I want to jump on what they just said. You should really talk to one of us about that, because if law school is your end goal, then you don't really need that MLS degree. And um, a lot of it goes back to what kind of advising are you getting before you do these things? And we want to be helpful to those type of students. So if you have those questions, you know, any of us could walk you through kind of the differences in the programs and um, help you decide which is best. Rodina, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, there there are, you know, some not, not every single PLSI student ends up getting accepted into law school at the end of the summer. And so some law schools have offered them uh, an MLS program, like a master's in law program, but what the student really wants is to go to law school. So again, you know, I, I, and, but, you know, and maybe that just means more time. Uh, you know, not everyone gets in the first time that they apply. Um, it's, you know, a lot of, you, you, you learn as you move along and things change and, um, and so if, if your goal is really to go to law school and be a lawyer, stick with that goal. Uh, because we've had students who have, you know, been talked into the MLS program and then they incur debt for the MLS program. And then when they're done, they get into a JD program and now they're incurring debt for their JD program. So it's, <laughs> yeah, just talk to one of us. <laughs> <laughs> before doing that. And I see that there's some questions about the GRE and I haven't read through all of them, but it seems like there's some questions regarding do law schools accept the GRE or, or is the LSAT going away? Are those the, it seems like those might be the questions. And I'll tell you that for PLSI, we require the LSAT. Um, and because those are, you know, it's, it's from the Law School Admissions Council uh, and we find that while there are some schools, some law schools who will accept the GRE, the vast majority of them do not. Um, and they are, they are requiring the LSAT score. And so we wouldn't be doing you any favors if we accepted you into PLSI with a GRE score and every law school that you want to apply to requires the LSAT score. So we require the LSAT score. And that's another um, point too that I was going to put bring up in that question is that you know so if you know that you have issues or challenges with taking tests, that's an institutional resource um, solution. So it's not necessarily the law school, but you should go into the school itself and see like how do they support students who may have um, challenges testing disabilities. What sort of resources are available to be supportive to that because that's where you're gonna get your answer and it's not gonna be at the law school. Um, and we'll know of some of those resources in the way that sort of they sort of surface because it's not just Native American students who are you know, having challenges taking the LSATs, it's students across the board. So that's another point too to remember is that even though you're getting into law school, they're a part of a larger institution that has resources that can be helpful. So don't disassociate them so much so that you can't refer back to the institution itself for, for support and resources. So if you're looking at a law school, go back into the institution to see what they have as a disability statement and see what often what they can um, supply in reference to sort of being helpful for um, testing and test, you know, test taking. Maybe even look at the institution that you're in now um, to see if they can be helpful to some degree. Because um, those are resources that we probably overlook in some of our situations as well. Thank you for bringing it up. And another point, school costs money. And unfortunately, Native students, when it gets to graduate level, 
it's hard to find dollars. You will work to supply your own dollars to pay for school. So know that that's going to be a part of this challenge too. So, uh, you know, so we're, um, I'm glad that Rodina pulled it out. Like talking to people about your career path is very helpful for just knowing what to do. But it's also a very financial, you know, fiscal responsibility capacity building piece too, because then it helps you sort of understand like, do how much money am I going to have to take out? Will I have to take out money? Like, what is this going to cost over time? You know, because you know, um, and, you know my tribe is one of the few in, in the United States that funds, you know, one uh, bachelor's, one master's, and one PhD. And I could substitute my PhD um, for the um, for the for a JD if I wanted. But there aren't tribes that do that. And you know, and then even if they do offer money, it's very little money to some, you know, to any. So just know that there are resources that are available, but it's very few and far between that you're going to find in the native um, scholarship area where we can fund you completely from from your bachelor's all the way to a PhD. We'll have ways of supporting that, but there are other um, scholarship opportunities, and I'm hoping we'll hear more in the admissions on Thursday conversation about. You are more competitive as a student um, in a professional setting versus a Native American student within a Native scholarship setting. So just know that you know if you're applying for 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 scholarships and graduate, become a professional before you be, be before you're Native, uh, because you will be more competitive in those fields or those areas that you're trying to get into as a Native person, and you're probably few and far between. Um, as far as applicants go and reference sort of identifying as native. So just think about that as you move forward in some of your scholarship search. So this is a question specifically for Rodina, I believe. Um, Sarah asked a question about um, the LSAT score admittance into your program. Like, is there, is there, is there, um, what information do, can you offer to her about low score versus high score? What does you need to get into the program? That's, that's, that's always hard, right? Um, we don't have a cutoff for the program. And you'll find that, you know, there aren't going to be a lot of law schools either who are going to tell you there's a cutoff. <laughs> you know, if you look at the medians of law schools and, you know, and that's why it's so important to apply early to law schools, because you could apply at a point where, um, you know, the numbers aren't set yet. If you're applying early to law school, um, the numbers aren't set yet. They, they might have a little bit more um, flexibility in accepting students with lower uh, LSAT scores. But just be aware that um, usually if your LSAT score is a little lower, they really want your GPA to be higher. <laughs> um, there, there is, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll let Kristen and Kate talk about the, you know, the admissions, the law school admissions part of it, but for PLSI, um, we really do want to see, uh, can we get you into law school by the end of the, you know, if you're, if you're already accepted to law school, your chances of getting into PLSI are really good <laughs> because our purpose is to prepare you for law school. If you have a conditional admit, if you have a conditional admit based on, you know, we'll accept you if you attend PLSI, you get really high priority in our program for acceptance. Um, but our purpose if you have been, if you have applied to a law school and you have not been admitted, one of the things we look at is, are we, can we work with this student over just this short time frame, in these eight weeks to, sh to give law schools that additional consideration that they would feel good about accepting this student? And if you're, if you're looking at, real, if, it's, if it's overcoming low LSAT scores, if it's overcoming, it depends on what it is, right? It could be a writing thing that you need to work on your writing. And that's why we're talking about, um, you know, start this process as early as possible. Start talking to people like, you know, like, like us, like Kate and Kristen and Jack, start talking to folks like us to get some feedback um, so that you're, you know, you're off in the right direction. But we don't accept everyone into PLSI. There are times when I say, I think that maybe you need a little bit more work on your um, on, on your LSAT score. Um, sometimes it's a GPA issue, um, but we have to feel confident that by the end of the summer in that really short time frame, we would be able to get you into law school. Um, and, and sometimes it's just, it's not forever. If it's a no, it's not forever. You know, we'll give you some things to work on for next year. And that happens all the time. 
it happens all the time that, you know, we'll tell a student to wait a year, they get all their stuff together and they get accepted to law school before they ever come, you know, back to us. And then they, they can go to PLSI. And also PLSI is not something that you want to try to do um, just to see if you're interested in law school. Uh, because it's, we're preparing you for law school in the fall. Um, and it, these are the skills that you will take with you in the fall. And so if you're planning on, you know, going to PLSI and then applying to law school in a couple of years, you will have forgotten all the skills that we just taught you. And it's, that's no good. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so this question I think was addressed in a couple of different ways, but bar exam examine or um, assistance. And I think that Rodina, you mentioned that that's available through PSI, PLSI, um, regardless of whether they do the program at all. I was wondering, Kate and Kristen, do you know if any of the um, law um, groups do any other assistance like that? Does there's, NAMPA there's, have anything? There's financial assistance through the National Native American Bar Association. And there's also different scholarships um, <clears throat> offered through local bar associations at different states. So, um, you know, they, you have to do a little bit of digging, but um, extra resources can be found. I will say law schools, uh, you know, we're, we're a professional school. So we're, you know, we're preparing people uh, to enter a very specific profession um, and we are judged, right? Um, by US News and World Report rankings and others based on how successful we are. It's part of why admissions officers are so picky, um, right? Because then most of the time, and this isn't universally true for every law school, but most of the time, once you get there, we want to throw every single resource at you imaginable so you can be successful. We're not trying to weed people out. We're not trying to make your life miserable. We're not trying to take a year's worth of tuition from you and then send you on your way and tell you you couldn't make it, right? Um, and in fact, we're, our, our sort of outcomes are tied together. So we're judged by things like our career placement rate. Did people get jobs? We're judged by things like our bar pass rate. Did you pass the bar the first time that you tried to take it in, in a particular jurisdiction? Um, and so we have a really vested interest in, in your success. There are lots of programs within law schools. Um, not every law school is the same, but often there may be pre-orientation programs that could work with, um, and in addition to PLSI, uh, there are academic skills or academic support programs that can be focused on first year courses or on bar preparatory kinds of programs. Schools may have their own bar prep program um, kind of that runs alongside or in parallel to the regular curriculum. Um, schools, uh, many, many schools offer a bar study loan. You may not be interested in taking out more loans. <clears throat> but if the question is, do I have $3,500 to pay for it? And the answer is no, um, you know, you, finding that resource somewhere can be critical, even if it is an institutional bar study loan. Um, and then last summer, for example, because of COVID, you know, we also did things like for students who didn't have a quiet private space that would meet the bar's requirement for being able to take the test administered remotely, we did things like help them find a hotel room or make sure that they had really stable Wi-Fi, right? Because the last thing you want is for someone's you know, bar prep to go out the window because something went wrong kind of during the test. So um, I think the, the bar is a real barrier and I'm incredibly happy to see the work that Rodina has done and, and uh, National uh, uh, NALSA or Native American uh, Bar Association have done. But I also, um, I, I hope that you realize like three years occur between admissions and the bar. So you have three years to prepare. And part of why we talk so much about fit, it, it, you know, and finding the right law school for you is where is a place where you're going to feel like you belong? Where is a place where you feel like you're going to thrive, where you're going to get the academic, emotional, or other support that you might need um, to really reach your own goals so that we get to the end of those three years and you're not scrambling, panicking about the bar a challenging exam, but instead feeling really like um, I, I, you know, whether or not I pass it this time, like I have the tools, I can do this, and, and I've been prepared to do it. So it's my spiel. I'm glad that you said that um, the institutions are actually invested in outcomes, which I think is something that is super important for you all to realize. The institution hires people to be helpful to you, and working in higher ed for a number of years, and it's not just native students, but students don't take advantage of the people who are there to be helpful. So, you know, when these are three individuals who've been working in this space for a long time, and we know what it feels like to have to go through some of these challenges. So we're here to be helpful for sure, 
but know that you know there are people who are on campus that may or may not be native who are also there to be helpful. They may not be helpful in the way that you want them to be, but they actually can be a resource to some degree, you know, and then you come to us and say like, I'm looking for this specifically because they weren't helpful. But the thing is, is that, you know, um, hold in your heart, if you can, that your success at the institution really is a, um, a metric to talk about how successful that institution is. So because of that, and the way that Kristen just laid it out, that's awesome. Like they want to see you succeed. They want you to see you complete. They want to see you, you know, test well. They want you to see you into um, enrollment or um, into placement for job. You know, so just know that that's even something that's really crucial to this. And you need to start talking to people at those institutions to be helpful to getting you to where you want to go. And I always tell students this too, like we can't be helpful until you start asking us questions and telling us what it is that you want to know. And you know, and that's the thing, it's pretty simple, but I know sometimes it's really hard. You're doing a great job here today, which I love. Uh, and I'm going to move into the next section because this is coming up in a lot of different ways. So preparing for, um, for law school, if you are not in a pre-law program, um, so like what courses or what can you guys offer in reference to information about like how to, how to one, prepare for law school if there is a preparance period, if there are courses that can be helpful. And then two, like how do I take my, um, my bachelor's degree and tie it into law? Like if there's could be some advice about thinking about that. So I'll start with wherever, whoever wants to start off. I guess, I guess my two cents on that would be any type of bachelor's degree. Um, you don't have to be pre-law. We have artists, we have teachers, we have math majors, we have science majors, we have business majors, philosophy. Really, um, we've seen all kinds of students have success in law school um, from all different types of background. What we're looking for are dedicated students who are going to work hard and, um, and be successful. So I saw some of the GPA questions. So we will look at your undergrad cumulative GPA. We will acknowledge a master's degree and it shows that you're dedicated to certain field of study and that, um, but we expect you to have good grades in your master's degree. So that's why um, it's a little bit different of a weight. Um, Kristen, I don't know if you want to take it away for. No, I mean, I think that's exactly right. There's, there's no prerequisites. So unlike medical school, right, where you have to have taken organic chemistry and bio 1A and 1B and calculus, there isn't any of that, which is exciting and also maybe confusing because then you're not sure and you ask us what you're supposed to take. Um, uh, you know, people do come from all sort of uh, training and backgrounds. Um, you do have to have a BA or a BS degree. So if you went and got an AA first, that's fantastic. Uh, but ultimately you have to, to apply to a law school to a JD program, typically have a BA or a BS. You may also have another degree. Um, law touches everything, right? Um, so, you know, Next time you pull into a parking garage, flip the ticket over and read the terms and conditions that you just agreed to by driving underneath that, that gate. Um, it turns out your car could blow up and it's not their fault. Um, but um, uh, it, you know, it's also true that, that uh, community economic development is a social justice issue, it's a racial justice issue. It can be a land use issue, it can be an environmental <coughs> regulation issue. It's a law business and entrepreneurship issue. Like law sort of sits in this space that really the, the center of the wheel hub um, in some ways, and it's sort of difficult to, to, to get away from. So we want people in our classes that come from lots of different training and background. If you were all poli-sci majors, and we love poli-sci majors, but if you were all poli-sci majors, it would be very boring and very few of you would be signing up for patent law um, and, and some of those other courses. And, and we're trying to train pr professionals in all of those areas. Um, I know that personally, so I was a double major in rhetoric and Native American studies. Um, I enjoyed kind of the classical training of, of rhetoric and the, the training in argumentation and effective writing, which was very helpful. Um, Native American studies was extremely grounding. And for me, those two made sense together. When I got to law school, I felt totally prepared, even though I'd really never taken law classes, except I think I took uh, racism in US law and federal Indian law through Native American studies. Um, 
I wished I'd taken some economics. That's my only spiel. <laughs> like, um, so I felt like there was a, nobody told me that we went to law school and sort of the theoretical underpinnings of law and economics or really white Western economic theory as a way of understanding the law and determining what is a just outcome when you're dealing with the case. Nobody told me that that mattered. And so I hadn't taken micro or macro econ or any of those related courses. Um, and um, I just had some extra work to do, right? I just had some sort of independent work to do to get familiar with the language. Um, but nobody's taken law school classes until they get there and then you're all thrown in together. Um, and so actually, if you do PLSI, you'll have a tremendous advantage because you will have taken a law school class. Um, so I, I would, I would lean on PLSI in that regard um, and not worry that you were, you know, a major in any particular thing and whether it's going to be helpful or not. I'll, I'll add one thing um, is that I, I do notice that the students who have the hardest time maybe in PLSI um, are the ones who have been avoiding writing, <laughs> who, who avoid um, not necessarily writing classes, but any classes where they have to submit something written, an organized piece of writing. Um, and those folks tend to have a harder time. It's harder to adjust to law school if you avoid writing. Um, and, you know, so much. I know that there's these images out there that, you know, lawyers go to court and they argue and it's all verbal and they win their cases or they lose their cases because they're a bad, you know, uh, arguer. And um, really, I mean, all of these folks here will tell you that things are won and lost based on your writing. It's, it's what you submit to the court beforehand and, you know, and for PLSI, what you're submitting to your, your professors. And so, you know, being comfortable accepting feedback on your writing is gonna be really important in law school and in PLSI. Um, now I did grad work before I went to PLSI and I remember seeing my first writing assignment come back to me and how horrified I was that it was all red ink. And I was, you know, insulted. I'm a great writer. <laughs> I'm such a good writer. Everyone's always told me how good of a writer I am. Um, but that wasn't legal writing and legal writing is different. And I had to embrace the feedback and, uh, and learn this new skill, this new way of writing so that I could be successful in law school. And that is going to be important, you know, to be open to all of that in these programs, right? To be, you know, you're, you're coming to a group of professionals in these programs. So, you know, take their advice. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's hard too, because with so many students, you come with, you come with a, a set of skills that have been working for you. And we all sort of rely on this, right? Like you're, you're, you're in this position where you're looking at law schools because you're successful at what you're doing, right? Um, but everyone in law school is, you know, they're all smart. They all got there, you know, on, on the merits and um, and just being able to be open to taking feedback and um, working on those skills so that you can be successful. That's just going to be really important. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing up writing, because I think writing is probably where um, a lot of the um, hurdles and challenges seem to emerge when I work with students moving from bachelor's into graduate programs in general. You know, it's not necessarily just sort of the, the, um, the capacity to have grammatical sort of, you know, prowess, but it's also just being able to sort of spit out words that make sense, you know, because it's, um, you know, we're trained, you know, and I'm, I'm guilty of this for working in higher ed for a, a long time, you know, training people how to write specifically to a specific audience to do something specific. When really, we need to be working and helping you be able to tell your story, your narrative in a way that's pointed enough that is helpful for us to sort of discern what it is that we need to be doing to be helpful to you. And I think that that is sort of a, a hard thing to learn to some degree. Um, and it's not necessarily built upon emotion um, and it's more um, pragmatic than it sounds where, you know, um, if you want to do something specifically to be helpful for your community, Saying that in that terminology is helpful, but like, I want to know specifically, like, what is it that you hope to do to be helpful? Like, how are you gonna change? 
what is it that you know about yourself that needs to change? And how do you get to the point of sort of understanding that this is the thing that can really happen if you institution support me in developing my skill sets to move forward in this, in this arena, whatever that may look like. So it's not necessarily getting away from the idea of sort of um, um, sharing your narrative, but it's trying, trying to help you to be more specific. And in that spe specificity, people feel like we're um, asking you to um, brag, but I don't, I don't necessarily hear that when I say what I just said. Because if you have an interest in, you know, for example, there's a student I worked with and he wanted to, um, he was going to culinary school. So I asked him specifically, like, why are you going to culinary school? Five or six answers, none of them seemed to sell what he was telling me. Then he said, well, here's the real story. Um, I'm going to culinary school because <clears throat> I had, um, I lived on, I was homeless for a while. And when I was homeless, my mom had to feed us through um, digging through trash cans. And he goes, I wondered if I could learn how to harness the capacity to be able to be helpful to build some sort of cookbook or some sort of like guide to help people who have to live on the streets and who are eating from trash cans, like how to build nutritional meals from that. And he goes, and so I want to learn how to do that so I can understand like how to be helpful to this community that I'm from. And I was like, what? Like, that is crazy. So and then, you know, then he goes, but then he goes, I also want to own a restaurant so I can build resource so that I can, you know, create a, um, a fleet of um, food trucks to help feed the homeless in, in, um, in Albuquerque. And I'm like, are you telling anybody this story? And he's like, no. And I'm like, why not? And he goes, well, because I'm kind of embarrassed. And I'm just like, well, I said, you could be embarrassed. But the thing is, is that you are solution driven individual to be helpful in this way. And I said, and that storyline that you want to be provisional by supplying cookbook on teaching people how to eat from trash is super amazing because there's something about it that is, who's doing that work? How are you being helpful? I can see it. And I said, if you wrote that story in your essay for scholarships, I said, more often than not, people are going to be willing to, to, to give you funding for that because it sounds amazing to me. So that's the thing that we're asking you to do is to, to not tell us about your skill sets, that all the skill sets are in there. Like it's not necessarily heralding those, it's sort of getting at the work. You know, the way that I put it to, to students I work with, you know, we say this a lot, you're here for a reason. You know, creators giving you skill sets to do things. And the more you hide them, the harder it is for you to do them. So acknowledge what you can do. And that's not like telling people that you're, 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 you're an amazing spokesperson. You may be, but you may not be. So try to figure out like what it is that you actually do and how is that translating into the possibility of you being helpful to your community? Like, do you show up every day to be helpful to talk to students? Do you show up every day to be helpful to talk to elders? Do you show up when people ask you to sort of uh, to haul wood? Do you show up when people ask you to help, you know, arrange events? Those are capacity pieces that are, are um, short serviced because they are skill sets that seem to be um, landing in different ways. I'm working with my niece and she's younger, you know, and, you know, she comes to uh, be helpful for community events, but she's having a hard time understanding. People can tell you like, hey, get this room set up and then she'll do it and she'll do it exactly right. And I'm just like, so many skill sets in just that. And she's like, I don't know what you talk, what you're saying. I'm like, because you can take and do something and execute it without much direction. You have an idea, you've done it before, you know knowledge, you can train people, you can pull other kids in to be helpful to do this. And it's just one of those things where you have to sort of think critically about what you do to be helpful to get you to where you wanna go. And again, a, a conversation of like, this is what I do, does it make sense? We can be helpful to sort of putting that into language to be useful for that. Um, we are drawing close on time and I wanna make sure I get this one question in. Um, Incarceration, um, how does a student, if, if there is any you know, um, um, quantifier or support or anything that sort of plays into this, if a student has been formally incarcerated and they wanna to go to law school, challenges, um, hurdles, barriers, resources? We've, we've had lots of students who've had criminal backgrounds um, and it just depends on it's usually looked at on a case by case basis, you know, going to law school is one matter, but then whether you'd be admitted to practice 
will um, be determined on the nature of the offense. Um, um, for those of you who don't, might not realize this, just because you graduate from law school does not make you an attorney. You have to go through an extensive background check and pass a bar exam and pass character and fitness. And character and fitness basically checks to see if you're trustworthy enough to um, take care of somebody else's um, problems and um, resources. And um, so let's say that you went to jail for fraud. You might have a really hard time with that versus if it was a bar fight and you assaulted somebody, you know, 30 years ago. It really just depends on, on the details of each offense. Yeah, um, this, sorry, this is, this is a common, you are not alone, okay? So there are lots of people either because eh, they lived a different life a long time ago or because the whole reason they wanna to go to law school is because they are system impacted in some way, right? Like they, they came out of being in prison and therefore became inspired to you know, look at criminal defense, right? Um, uh, we see many, many applicants who have criminal histories. Um, I'll, I'll give you some really general advice. Every law school application is gonna have a question about this. Every law school application is gonna have a question that could be a little different from another law school's application question because we're in different jurisdictions and we re we're responsible to different state bars. So this is a great first introduction to being a detail-oriented critical reader, um, right? And you have to make sure that you're answering the question completely and fully. Um, if someone checks yes to a criminal history and doesn't write an explanation, it's pretty much an automatic deny. Um, if they write an explanation, then the answer is, it, it sort of depends on, on that explanation and some other variables. Uh, so the other thing I would say is to err on the side of transparency. Um, what you don't wanna do is, you know, something that is literally happening to someone at my law school right now, who I, I don't know who it is, but they went to a clinical faculty member and said, you know, I've been hearing all these presentations about getting ready for the bar, there are two L, and um, I realized there's something I didn't disclose that I was supposed to have disclosed. What do I do now? What are the consequences for that, right? Um, so, you know, you need to make sure that you're answering the question, they're being fulsome. And then for us, it really depends on, you know, it can depend on severity, it can depend on um, recency, um, it can depend on kind of how taking personal responsibility um, or whether or not, you know, it was the friend's fault who made you hold the open container um, or, or some of those things. Um, we admit people all the time. With, with criminal convictions. Um, so it is not, a, it's not a bar. There are some resources. There's actually now a new bar association called the National Justice Impacted Bar Association because there are enough lawyers and actually enough law professors um, who, are, who have been through this that they have formed their own bar association. And I'll try to put the link in the website, but they partnered with the Law School Admissions Council to do a survey of law admissions officers to get results to find out what is in the minds of law admissions officers and what kind of barriers and opportunities are faced by people who are, are justice system impacted. So this is a huge emerging area. It's being talked about a lot more. It's a fantastic question to ask any law school representative, but there are some national resources that I, I can post. Great. Anything else you want to add, Radina, or no? I, I, I agree with everything that they said. I think it's really, especially to err on the side of transparency. Just tell them about it. You might be thinking, oh, well, they don't wanna know about this. Um, they do. <laughs> and it, the problem is what Kristen was saying that later on, this could be something that prevents you from, it's, it's, it's an honor code sort of thing. You know, it, it could prevent you from becoming a member of the bar and they need to know all of that before they accept you. So just, you know, put it all out there on paper and tell them if you, you know, I've helped some students sort of word things and talk about things in a way where they feel like, you know, they're being transparent about it. And then they're now explaining like what this meant in their lives and what the personal responsibility is. Um, that's important um, for, you know, for these conversations. And it really does depend on the law school. I've worked with different law schools and some things, and because they're looking at the character and fitness for the bar exam later, it depends on the state. So, 
you know, it, it sometimes depends on the law school, but if you get it all out there, then they can, you know, they can follow up with you and make their decisions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, well, we have five minutes and I have a uh, two question piece. Oh, did you want to say something, Kate? Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to give one quick spiel. I know we're running out of time, but um, for Rodina's uh, Pre-Law Summer Institute, I wanted to say that um, later this week, you're gonna hear from women on the Careers in Law panel. And in 1995, I went to the program PLSI with Brenda and Jaylene, who will be on that panel. And it's, um, it's exciting for me. And I wanted to use that as an, ex as an example because we're still friends to this day, all those years later, and we built relationships through that program. And now our kids are gonna to go to college together. And so I just wanted to use that as an example of um, what you could build, you know, as you're getting ready to go to law school. So um, enjoy them and tell them Kate said hi. But um, you really do need friends and partners going, even if you go to different law schools, having these connections are meaningful. Yeah, Rodina was talking about how she went to Deb Holland's house for Thanksgiving and Kristen and I are just like, we're on board with getting to Deb Holland's house for pies on Thanksgiving. So, you know, that's just one of those things that I think that is super crucial about programs like these is that, you know, um, they're both fun and um, invigorating, but man, like you don't realize like the network that you build. Cause you know, I ran a program in DC called WINS, Washington Internship for Native Students. And I am watching those students do some amazing things across the country. And it's just one of those things where you just didn't really think about this college student, you know, becoming this person who is leading this organization or that agency or stepping into this role for their tribe. So all of these people and all of you have the capacity to be something that we kind of want and need is more people to not leaders, but just do really good work, good, solid work. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and wrap it up. So basic criteria for your programs. And then somebody had um, asked the question, I want to go to law school. So where do I start? <laughs> so if you could give any good last minute solid tips about where do you start, then just throw it at them really quick. And we had one question. I'm going to see if I can pull it up real quick. I thought it was a good question. While you're looking for that, if you don't know where to start, come to our program and we'll walk you through how to apply things you need to think about. And our program uh, is open. We'd like to see sophomores um, in college on up. So if you've already graduated from undergrad, you're welcome to attend. Freshmen, give yourself another year so you can figure things out a little bit, but we will walk you through the whole thing and you can ask us all kinds of questions. Awesome. The question was, can I go to law school in one state and take the bar exam in another? Yes. So that's Absolutely. it. Your advice and criteria, Kristen. Oh, I don't know. I'm just going to say the same thing Kate said. <laughs> I mean, come to the program. Um, know that, there, you know, it's sort of like daunting and complicated. Um, and also it's not, um, you know, a, a, a little bit. It's think about, you know, taking a test, filling out some applications ending up with choices um, and deciding what you want to do. So, um, you know, we try not to place too much emphasis on the test, but it is a, a big issue. The test is good. The score for LSAT is good for five years. So you could decide to take the test because it's a great time for you now because you're working from home or life's, you know, less stressful, or you could decide not to take it right now because it's a terrible time for you. But if you take it now, it's going to be good for five years. So you don't have to decide that that means that in the fall of 22, you're coming to law school. Um, you have some flexibility there. So just know that those things can kind of be pulled apart a little bit that we we push people to this kind of like the timeline I think I shared in chat, like do this, then this, then this, then this, then this, this, this. but it can in fact be be pulled apart in certain kinds of ways. Um, and um, yeah, if you're if you're interested, come come to the program and we'll try to walk you through it as much as possible. Rodina. Start with the pipeline <laughs> um, and, you know, just like don't, 
it, it is so important to start there and to start and start early. Like if you're, it's great if you're two years out, that's great if you're two years out. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just really hard for me when I get students who want to go to law school in the fall and they're coming to me now and they haven't taken the LSAT. Um, that's just not a good place to start. Like, think about the timeline and just, you know, go to pipeline. They'll tell you everything, what you should put in your, you know, your personal statement. You'll, you know, you'll meet mentors and have the opportunity for another cohort. It's, I wish I had that program because I, I can't imagine what my law school applications looked like. <laughs> nice. So um, as we wrap up today, again, thank you, um, Rodina, Kate, and Kristen for your time, your energy, your thought, your insights, your great wisdom, um, and all of the work that you've done to get us this far. So um, I just think of the work that they do and the, and the people that they've influenced and the things that we've done together and just sort of the people that have emerged over time. It's just, it's, um, it brings me to tears apparently. So thank you, I appreciate you and I'm so happy. So um, with wrapping it up, thank you all for joining today. And then also remember that there are people at these schools that are here to be helpful. So if you're thinking about a place to start, you could start with your school. Maybe they have a law school, maybe go over, traipse around it, meet some people, have a conversation. Do you have an idea of like where you want to go to law school? It might be, you know, somewhere where we're located, um, three presenters are located. You could reach out to them or you could reach out to the law school themselves. They have admissions offices that are willing to talk. And again, we will have a conversation with um, Brenda, Tanita Pipestem, um, Sarah Davidson, and um, Jolene Kulikish. I have a hard time saying her last name, sorry. Um, and then also on Thursday, we'll have schools presenting admission dolphins admissions offices presenting on their programs. Um, so you can come back and um, listen to them and ask some of these questions of them for, for their ears and their input. So thank you all again for being here.